Now, some 32 African countries have so far reported less than 5,000 COVID-19 cases amid a major spike of new cases across few African countries. The Africa Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, Africa CDC, disclosed this in a statement issued on Monday in Addis Ababa. The centre noted that the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Africa surged to 1.1 million plus as the death toll from the pandemic rose to 27,779 as at Monday. It added that eight African countries had reported positive COVID-19 cases ranging between 5,000 to 10,000. The African CDC also noted that three African countries, Egypt, Nigeria and Morocco, reported positive COVID-19 cases ranging within 50,001 to 100,000. South Africa is the only African country that reported above 100,000 confirmed positive COVID-19 cases so far, which stands at 609,773, according to the Africa CDC. Joining us live now is Professor Chima Onoka. He is a professor of community medicine in Nigeria. Also joining us from Ghana is Dr. Yakubu Yali, a medical doctor. We also have uh, Dr. Samia Gautam from South Africa. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, gentlemen and lady. Let's start with you, uh, Dr. Chima. Nigeria has passed the 50,000 mark and also surpassed the 1,000 mark uh, for fatalities, yet we see people moving like nothing is happening. Have we conquered COVID-19 already? We're far from conquering it. Um, maybe we are adapting better or in a stronger way, but we're far from conquering it. But it's apparent that people are respecting it less and um, people have moved on with their lives, maybe because of how things are in the country. Um, but we're far from conquering it um, in Nigeria and in many African countries. It's the same issue. All right, let me, let me come to you, uh, Dr. Samia. Uh, over 3 million plus tests have been conducted in South Africa. We also know that the positive cases is over 600,000 uh, currently. Um, we also know that uh, positive cases identified so far, about 500,000 um, recoveries recorded and I think 13,000 uh, deaths reported so far. The figures are still very high. How are South Africans living with this reality that COVID-19 seems very much active uh, in your country? Good morning. Thank you for asking me that. I think uh, definitely the cases are still high in South Africa, but... The base thing what I'm observing recently is that people are accepting the reality. People are getting more educated about this disease. And accordingly, they are taking high precautions and uh, they're looking after themselves. They are doing the responsibility towards their side. So I think this is the base thing. And they're building a stamina more and more to fight against this disease. Because I believe once you have a strong willpower, then you can fight with this disease in any condition. So, yes, definitely the cases are very high, but I think the accepting tolerance of the people is increasing. All right, let's bring you in, Dr. Yusuf. You have been actively engaged during this uh, period of the pandemic. What is the current situation in Ghana? Okay, thank you for this question. Um, I'll just go straight into the specifics as far as Ghana is concerned. Um, Ghana is one of the countries that has carried out one of the largest number of um, testings in the sub-region. Aside that, too, we also have um, um, confirmed cases of about 43,000 plus. With these confirmed cases, we only have, um, it's not only though, but then we have a death um, um, statistics of um, 263, which is um, reasonably lower than most countries in the sub-region as well. So the number of discoveries, as Ghana uses the reviewed um, WHO protocol in discharging um, her patients, we've discharged over, that's recovery slash discharge, over 41,000. So the current active cases says, um, is currently a little over 1,600. 
So that is the situation of Ghana currently. The death rates are on the low. The recoveries are very high. And then we have um, um, active cases of a little over 1,600. So that's currently the status report in um, Ghana. All right. Um, let's get back to you, Dr. Onoka. Uh, Nigeria has gone through different phases. Now it seems from being extremely cautious, we seem to have thrown caution uh, to the winds. Um, what do you think is responsible for this? And how can we rim ourselves back in to be very uh, conscious that we still have COVID-19? Um, apparently, you see like what we have in South Africa and Ghana, those two countries have tested far more than Nigeria has tested. Um, the confirmed cases in Nigeria is similar to what you have in Ghana, even though we have tested far less. And then death seems to be, you've, you've had, we've had more people dying in Nigeria than in Ghana. Um, it gives us that picture that um, things are not where they should be. They're actually kind of worse than it is in many of these countries, many of the, you know, the neighboring countries. Um, I think that the response that we're having from individuals is more of turning a positive mind to it, that look, they've faced difficult situations in life, and there are many things that are killing people in Nigeria and so that they can overcome it. Um, probably that's something that we can build on to show that the stories that are there about the disease are still there. And that even with the positive mindset that we can go further because caring about deaths in most of our rural areas, there are people that are just going home and dying and you're hearing stories and those are not even tested by anybody. They are not counted. Nobody knows what is actually killing. But a lot of people are reporting that they're doing quite a lot of burials. Um, I think we need to tell those stories, especially for those who have had, who have been ill and who have recovered. And even where there have been deaths, those stories we need to bring out to the fore. And um, that can help people to think again and know that they should do what they're doing. Because in the streets, out in the streets, I mean, I, I did a poll the other day, and it's like one out of, you know, you have one out of about 30 people that I saw had a mask on. Would you That's say dangerous. that we are actually um, um, falling back with the tracing um, that was so um, done with a lot of enthusiasm when we started this. Is government uh, falling behind in tracing uh, these um, uh, possible victims or is it now that it is too much? Um, what strategies do you think they can take so we don't have these cases of unexplained deaths you alluded to uh, earlier, which could be um, COVID-19? We need to get down to the states and states have been given quite a lot of money now. Um, holding them accountable is a second is a, is another issue, because it's not like a national, you know, at the national level. Now, what's happening at the states, the local government areas, those levels, that's critical now. They've got a lot of money, and the the action that is there is that it looks very limited. Holding people accountable for that from the government side is critical. Um, those at that level um, for us to deal with that. And then what we can do with the citizens is really communicating the kind of information that um, I've talked about, the, about the realities of it. I'll come back to you, Dr. Noka. We really need to talk about how we can better do this because the attitude is really dropping when it comes to uh, taking uh, precautions. Let's go back to South Africa. Dr. Samia. One of the reasons the country opened up places and eased the lockdown was for economic reasons. When you look back at that decision, would you say it was the best thing uh, to do? And what would you recommend now? Would you still go with that decision? Uh, see, uh, when the lockdown was happening in South Africa, I think if I look at back at that time, that was a right decision because the virus was spreading very 
fast at that time and to control the virus, yes, of, uh, absolutely it was a good decision. Uh, but currently the lockdown is at ease, of course, because the economy is suffering and we have to look after our economy and our country as well. I personally feel that lockdown is not only the solution for prevention of COVID-19. The base thing is people must learn and to, uh, to take the responsibility of about all the precautions to protect themselves from COVID-19. So currently the lockdown is at ease and I believe it's okay. It's, uh, it's not needed that lockdown should carry on for now. Going by what is going on um, in, in South Africa now, um, do you think the survival has been, the survival of the uh, pandemic has been left to the people, taking responsibility? Is that the focus? Is that the new direction that's been taken in your country, as it seems in other countries as well? Uh, yes, uh, the thing is, there are two type of people, uh, the one who really understand the severity of this disease and the one who is not taking still the COVID-19 uh, seriously. So definitely the people are learning more. They are educating themselves about this disease. They're understanding the uh, severity of this disease and taking precautions, especially nowadays, if you can see like in South Africa, everybody is using face masks hand hygiene, social distancing. So I think this is one of the biggest things that people have learned. But still, there are people who need to learn all these things as well. So definitely, I must say that there is a progress going on and people are getting more aware about it. All right, Dr. Yusuf, some time ago, a video went viral where officials uh, were burying uh, those who died from COVID-19 and warning Ghanaians to take uh, the virus seriously and keep all uh, safety measures as prescribed. Would you say Ghanaians have paid heed to that warning in its entirety? Um, I wouldn't say they've paid heed to that warning in its entirety. And um, that is because of a number of um, reasons. Um, aside that warning, we've, we've had a, uh, a number of activities in the past few weeks, which has caused Ghanaians to kind of like relax on their taking um, COVID-19 seriously. One of such issues is the um, resumption of SHS3 students to write their WASI examination. Aside that, to around the same time, Ghana also embarked on a national voters registration, which saw to the registration of about 15 million to 16 million people. That's about 50 to 55 percent of the population of Ghana. This in itself created an impression, even though the leaders were trying to enforce the COVID-19 protocols, people generally felt that maybe the problem is not as serious as we have been told. So there has been, in the past few weeks, there have been some laxity with how people um, approach COVID-19 protocols. Even though we know that there is a legislative mm -hmm. instrument um, which could um, get you jailed if you are caught not observing the COVID-19 protocol passed by the president. Nonetheless, there is still a reasonable number of people who do not use face masks and then um, who do not observe social gathering, especially in our public spaces like the market, etc. So all of these are played into a narrative where some people feel maybe the virus is not there, maybe the virus is not as serious as it is, or maybe the virus is not as dangerous as they're making it look. So there is a mix of which I think it's not the right thing to do because there could be a spike in numbers if people continue this way, even though the government is doing what it can to try and make sure that people observe these protocols. Generally, people have become less um, 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 sensitive to observing Don't, don't, don't you think that maybe this uh, relaxation in attitude and compliance to the uh, protocols set out is largely because countries are now opening up economies and some people are saying isn't it time we uh, declassify the, the uh, virus as a pandemic i mean we're opening up the economy people are seeing that life is trying to get back to normal people are still getting infected they are not dying taking all of this into cognizance what would you say um, what I'll say is, um, if we sh if we study the last pandemic we had in the world, that's the Spanish flu, there was a time where people felt things were fine. There was actually 
um, like people got back to normalcy, sort of. But then before they knew what was happening, there was a second spike. And according to data, this was actually where the largest number of mortality was recorded during the Spanish um, um, flu um, 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 global pandemic. So I feel, regardless of the fact that people see that government is opening the country, the economy is opening up, we should still take COVID-19 protocols very seriously. Mind you, vaccines, there, are, there is no certified vaccine yet, even though some vaccines have undergone certain trials and have gotten um, past first stage and second stage, not uh, entirely. Trials are still being conducted. So things are still not well understood for people to kind of like let down their guard as far as COVID-19 is concerned, because it's still as serious as it was from the beginning. The only thing that has changed is our attitude, which is really scary because we are still trying to fully grasp the dangers COVID-19 can plunge Africa into. All right, let's, let's come back to you, uh, Dr. Chiba. Mm. I, I will ask the same question, uh, the issue of um, declassifying uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic, uh, because yet we don't, uh, yes, we don't have a vaccine as, as at the moment, but efforts are on. Trials have begun and economies are opening. So I will ask you, what is, uh, what part of the divide would you be um, in that conversation? Yeah, thank you. We can't declassify it because it's there and it's still a pandemic. Um, that's the truth. Um, the, the, you know, the, the impact on the society is what um, we're managing. And um, that's just where we are. The reality is there that the fear has gone down. If we maintain that information, like I said, um, remember the monkeypox. People were scared when they saw the picture of someone with monkeypox. That's why everybody, you know, people ran away, ran into their houses. The Ebola story, we kept telling the story of what was going on, and that helped with that caution. Um, if it dries up, if it dries up in the media space, especially the local media, um, if it gets taken up by the political activities, events, the Owen Bears, that's happening already. If the space gets taken up in the local media, the media closest to them, to people, um, not just the national, but the ones that they even watch um, and listen to um, in a costless way, um, we're not going to, it's going to be replaced by other things. And that's going on. You know, it's being replaced and um, Political activities are increasing and taking up the media space. Um, so if, if leaders are, have gone on to other things, the followers will definitely just go on to other things. And that's happening. Um, so we need to sustain that. But especially those who are recovering, those who are getting sick, we need to tell their stories consistently. Uh, certainly, we, 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 we actually have a couple of them um, joining us um, on the news. So you might want to stick around after our conversation to, you know, get an idea what they have been through. Uh, I'll come back to you for your final thoughts, Dr. Chima. But let's go back to Dr. Uh, Guatem. I want, I want to just um, uh, take your thought on maybe a time frame for us finding a vaccine for the virus? Because we know Italy already um, are going uh, towards, they are already in human trials. We also know other parts um, of the world working with WHO. Uh, they seem close to um, finding a solution. Uh, would you give a time frame that that would happen? Uh, are we going to get it earlier than predicted? Dr. Gwatton, can you hear me? Dr. Gwatton, can you hear me? Hi, hi. Sorry, repeat the repeat the question, please. Okay, I'm I'm talking about vaccines now. We know there are already human trials in Italy, and the WHO is working with I think over a hundred um, countries for this uh, vaccine. I'm asking, with the work that has been going on. Do you think we will get a vaccine before the prediction of 2021? 
how soon if you were to give a time frame see about vaccination uh, no one can predict when it's gonna come out to be honest it's quite unpredictable yes the different part of the countries they're trying their best to uh, to discover this vaccine but recently i was watching one of the news and i saw in the news that uh, i'm not sure if it is true or not but i i saw in the news that russia had ma uh, made the vaccine and they already uh, started giving vaccine in Russia, but I'm not 100% sure if it is, that is the correct news or not because I watched that on the TV. Yeah, I also saw but that news. But, you know, yeah. sorry? No, go ahead. I'm just uh, corroborating what you said. I saw that news as well. Yeah. So the thing is, if we talk about vaccine, it's quite unpredictable to say that uh, if we're going to get on the expected time or not. One can only try to get it early as soon as possible, but it's difficult to say that we will be able to get before 2021 or maybe end of the year 2020. All right, uh, Dr. Yakubu, uh, quickly, uh, we still have a pandemic and we need to find a way to uh, contain it until a vaccine uh, is found or maybe live with it for as long as it, it takes to get to that point. What advice would you give as a way forward in this fight Taking everything into consideration, the lack of adherence to safety protocols. Okay, um, I've always believed in constant um, information, keeping the information in the mind of people that this is a very serious situation we are dealing with. People should not forget at any point that this is a very serious virus we are dealing with. So the media, as um, Dr. Chima said, the local media in local content should consistently keep reminding people and then short stories of people who have been positive and then what they've gone through. Because trust me, it's not a joke if you see people who are living with COVID and with the complications. If people are able to share these stories and it's constantly in the minds of people, I think this would do a reasonable job with keeping people very conscious. Aside that, in Ghana, the government have taken a couple of measures to um, kind of like help with the situation, like giving health frontline workers a 50% pay rate. There was a reduction in um, um, prices of um, electricity and then free electricity and light for a reasonable number of the population. All of these goes to ease the stress and then challenges that was brought by COVID-19. So in other for these efforts not to be zero, the government also has to keep the population informed by constantly engaging the local media in communicating the dangers and the problems, the challenges, preventable measures on COVID-19. So this is my recommendation, and I think this is what needs to be done, both by individuals, both by the government. It could be a health worker, but just reach out there, talk to people, get them to know that this can kill. It could be you, it could be anybody, so they should take the protocol seriously. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yusuf, for that thought. I, I'll, I'll wrap things up with you, uh, Dr. Onoka. Uh, I want to ask you about the opening of our international airspace. Um, there seemed to be a lot going on to manage a possible uh, reintroduction of the virus, but how optimistic are you uh, that this is a good move and what Aside from what has been said, do you think the government can do to ensure we don't have a resurgence of high infections? Thanks. Um, we, it, it's, it's about decisions that are realistic. So I think everybody's taking a realist perspective that you know, the economy is going down, even in households. And remember that things like fuel prices have gone up again to where they were before the, you know, be, where they were before the lockdown. It came down. Um, the pressures are more. There are considerations of even tax increases in different ways in Nigeria. That's different from what we're hearing from Ghana here. So the strain on, on individuals is higher. So the international airports, <laughs> of course, we are with the the, the stage that, you know, where we are in the pandemic, no border is actually a border anymore. So 
the way you're having it is the way you're having the, you know, individuals who are positive moving across. It's unlike before. Um, by road, by sea, or by air, individuals are moving now. So it really doesn't, it really doesn't make much difference. Is that movement is there already. And um, it's not as if those who are outside the country will bring it more than, you know, much will make it more intense transmission than local transmission because it's established. Um, so it's the general protocols that need to be sustained. But from a, an emergency perspective, we move more towards a more systematic way of doing things. What are the implications in our health facilities? on a long-term basis, the entire system, we need to adjust the system so that the model of its operations is one that accommodates emergencies within routine activities. That's just what we need to do now and make whatever funds we have to count in that direction and not just to be having, you know, just that you have vertical um, interventions that are framed as emergencies. That is not sustainable. All right, Dr. Chimo Noka. Thank you very much for that. Um, I guess that's where we'll wrap things up for uh, this uh, particular segment of the uh, breakfast this morning. I want to thank you especially again, uh, Dr. Chima Onoka, Dr. Uh, Yakubu Yusuf, and Dr. Sawyam Samya Gautam. Thank you very much for your time and your Thank thoughts. you very much for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you.